morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. See everybody this morning. It's going to rain on us a little bit, but that's okay. We're in our life to us. Amen. 186. Every promise in the book is mine. After he had done the will of God, he might receive the promise. Hebrews 10, 36. And before we sing, how about listing a few of those promises? Just go around the room. We'll start with Ken. He's always right on the wall there. Ken. A promise from God's word. His, his, his word is truth. Amen. Peace. Never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. Go on. I don't know what you said. <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can get in here. <laughs> All this. All right. I just asked for a promise. We're going to sing every promise and the book is mine. And what is a promise? One of the promises God made us. There are so many. A promise God has made. To keep us safe. Yeah, all right. Never leave us nor forsake us. Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. There's so many things. There's actually hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of promises in God's word. All right, let's sing it. Every promise in the book of mine, 186. chapter number 7, actually Acts chapter number 6, we need to grab a little bit of context before we get too far ahead of ourselves, Acts chapter number 6, let's pray, Lord, thank you for this day, thank you for your word, pray please help us now as we seek to learn from it, Lord, help us to apply it to our lives, Lord, we love you, we thank you for so we're trying to mess up our broadcast here. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Technology and all. Acts chapter six. Boy, is anybody else warm this morning? It is warm in here. So that's all right. Uh, we, can, uh, we can survive. 
Acts chapter 6 and verse number 11, the Bible says here, Then they suburned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes that came upon him, and caught him and brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that, this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. We're talking about Stephen here, if you don't remember. Verse 1, then said the high priest, are these things so? Now we, we went through all of chapter 6 last time we were together. So now we're beginning chapter 7, but you, you needed to get that context of what's going on. Because we start with that question, are these things so? And, and at this point, Stephen has several options of what he can do in this situation. He has been drugged before a council, falsely accused of blasphemy, uh, the, the penalty of which would be death. And so he's, he's in a bit, of a, a bit of a bind here. So he could, in my opinion, he could deny the accusation and defend himself and the gospel, say, no, I wasn't, you know, I was not alive, this is the, this is the truth. Uh, so on and so forth. That's probably the route most people would take. He could deny the accusation and forsake his message to gain his own safety. He said, no, no, I never said any of that. Don't know what you're talking about. That was somebody else. I'm not even a Christian, you know, and go that route and try to just save his own skin there. Or uh, maybe he could accept the false charges and just suffer the consequences and just take it. Um, but he didn't do that either. He didn't do any of those things. He, uh, He's accused of blasphemy and asked whether the accusation is true, and his response, as we'll see in a moment, virtually ignores the question. He goes into a very long sermon uh, out of the question, are these things true? You know, they, you know, Brother Ken, uh, I heard you push Brother Pete in the head the other day, is that true? And you just start talking to me about Jesus. And I'm like, wait a second. It's, just, he just, it's like he doesn't even hear the question. It's like it doesn't even matter to him. He just goes off and he starts to starts to preach to him, and uh, I'd like to, to see that, but, but with verse 2 to verse 53 is, is the sermon, so we're not going to read that just yet, uh, but I want to show you that Stephen here is doing actually what Christ often did. Hold your place in Acts chapter 7, and look with me at John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Uh, there were several times in his ministry that Christ would be asked a question and he would uh, not give the answer that was expected or give no really no answer at all to the question that was asked. Acts chapter number, uh, sorry, uh, John chapter number 8 and verse number 3, the Bible says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us, that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? So that's the question. The law says we should kill her. What do you say? Verse 6, this, uh, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So they ask him this question. They're excited about maybe tricking him in, in the question, and he just starts drawing on the ground. Verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. So he does give them an answer, but the answer is, is really a, a statement that has nothing to do with that woman. He says, hey, if any of you are sinless, Go ahead and become the judge, jury, and executioner. And of, Christ, of course, Christ sitting there, he was without sin. He could have cast the first stone. That's a whole other message for one other day. But they ask him, the law says we should stone her. What do you say? And first he ignores them. And when they press and press and press, he says, okay, without, you know, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Not a very, uh, you know, we're, we're used to that answer because we've read the story before. We've heard it preached a lot. But that's not an answer you would expect from that question. <clears throat> Perhaps you would expect him to quote the passages in the Old Testament that were the law. I mean, he is the word of God. He knew it. Um, but, but no, he didn't do that. He, he kind of stunned them all with his answer to where they all left. Now, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter number 11. 
another circumstance in which the question is asked. Mark chapter 11, verse number 27. The Bible says, And they come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question, and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he answers your question with a question. Verse 30, The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. Verse 31, they reason with themselves, saying, If we shall say uh, from heaven, he will say, when, Why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people, for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. Jesus answering, saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now it could have easily just said, I am God, I am the Son of God, I do these things by my own authority. Um, but he didn't. He, he chose to, to put them in their place and show them that they don't know everything. Um, they, can't, they can't answer every question. Sometimes I think the, the leadership of the church, the leadership of a nation, the people that are used to making the decisions, we need to be reminded sometimes we don't always have the answer. And, and Christ, in both these circumstances, he doesn't really directly answer in the way they expect. He answers the question in the way that they need. He, he knows what their hearts need. He knows what they need to hear. And so regardless of the question that is asked of Christ, he formulates his answer in such a way that forces them to face uh, what they need to face. Like with the woman uh, taken in adultery, his answer to their question forced them all to consider their own sin. And when, when they brought this woman in saying, hey, look at this horrible sinner, and they left thinking, look at me, I'm a horrible sinner. And that's that's kind of what Christ does in people's lives. And so, so there's that one, and then there's this one. Um, let's look at one more, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Just a few pages back. Miss Linda, could you shut those yeah, back doors up? It's about to get loud. My, uh, my family's coming in the back. Matthew chapter 27, verse 11. Now, when they were going, oh, that's, verse, that's 28. 27, verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Very simple question. Pilate says, Are you the king of the Jews? And the answer, <laughs> Jesus said to him, Thou sayest. So you say I am. Now, I've always wondered about that. Like, why didn't he just say yes? Because he is. He's the king of kings, the lord of lords. Uh, but but he, he didn't. He said, he, he said Thou sayest. And it reminds me of when he's speaking with, with Nicodemus. It's like he, he knows he knows what they say about him in secret. He knows what they believe about him in their hearts. So he can just look at them and say, well, you think I am. Verse 12, and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? He answered him to him, uh, and he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Christ, when, when Christ was asked a question, you never know what was going to happen. I mean, he might go into a parable. He might give a direct answer. He might go off onto some topic that, that's not even, uh, not even related. You got the, the man that came to Christ as he was teaching, and he comes to him and he says, Hey, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. And Christ just goes off on a sermon, nothing to do with this question at all. And so... When I see Stephen here, he's, acu he's accused of all these things, wrongfully so, but instead of defending himself and, and articulating the best argument he can think of, he just starts preaching. He just goes all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to Abraham, and starts preaching to these people instead of defending himself, defending his message, or anything else. And so I think that, uh, that to me, that reminds me of Christ. He he would know and understand these people are asking for this information, but they need this information. They're asking the wrong question. Uh, and, and you've probably had this situation in your own lives. When you witness to people, you know, people, maybe they want to know about some 
crazy story in the Old Testament, or they want to know about some cult's beliefs, or you know, they want to know something that's fantastical, or they want to know what the you know what this beast in Revelation is and what this and that is, and you're just like you, you may want to know that. There's nothing wrong with wanting that knowledge, but what you need to know is Jesus Christ died for your sin. You, there's there's what people want to know, and there's what people need to know. Just like there's what people want to hear and what people need to hear. And uh, we're very familiar with that concept because we all want to hear that, you know, you're doing so well. Keep up the good work. Wonderful job. That was great. But sometimes what we need to hear is, that was pretty horrible. Do it again. <laughs> so my, my dad wasn't, uh, wasn't afraid to, to say things like that to me because he wanted me to grow up to actually do good work and, and take responsibility when I didn't. That, that's kind of a rare thing nowadays, but um, he, he, he answered them the way the answer they needed to hear, not the answer they didn't want to hear. So let's see what his answer is. Acts chapter 7 and verse number 2. We're going to read quite a bit here, so please follow along in your Bibles. And uh, we're going to read through this, this entire message, and then we'll go back and make some, some commentary on it. <clears throat> Acts chapter 7, verse number 2. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Karim, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall shew thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Karim, and from thence, uh, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now, uh, now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. This is all going to seem pretty familiar since we're going through the book of Genesis right now. Verse 6, And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised uh, him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a, de a dirt over all the land of Egypt, and came in great affliction, and our father found, uh, fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph uh, was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sychem, and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought, for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sychem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up, in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he shewed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons, and when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire and a bush. 
When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and, he, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning. And have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. After that he had shewed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Prophet shall the Lord your God raise up. Unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again unto Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for us for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we walk not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, ye have, uh, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Rep uh, Rephim, Figures which he made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus the, into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him in a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked, and uncircumcised, and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which shewed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by disposition of angels and have not kept it. That's a long, that's a long answer to are these things so? <laughs> You've been accused of blasphemy, is this true? And that was the answer. Now, you could break that down, and you can learn a whole lot about Old Testament, you can learn a whole lot about a lot of things in, in that message, but, but we're looking at, at things in Acts right now, and so we're, we're going to look at this message from that perspective of, of what is he trying to do by, by declaring all this to, the, to his captors. In verses 2 through 50, he simply tells the story of God's dealings with Israel. Reminding the men where they come from and also showing that he himself is no fool. He knows the scriptures. He knows the story. He knows the word of God. He's not just some, some guy that came off the street and started preaching Christ. He knows Israel. He knows the past. He knows the word of God. So, so he has that evidence of that. He gives the historical background of Israel. Reminds them of, of where they come from. And then in verse 51... There's an abrupt switch in gears, and he begins to not just preach and teach the stories of Israel, but now direct application to the lives of the men he was speaking to. Your fathers killed the prophets. You killed Christ. You were given the law, and you haven't kept it. You, had, you were given the just one, and you betrayed him and murdered him. He went from you know, going, going along telling the story of Israel to all of a sudden, you're a bunch of murderers. <laughs> You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard ears. You always resist the Holy Ghost. That's that's a big, that's a big turn. Be like me, just kind of 
going along telling about, you know, telling about the history of Israel and talking about things, and then I just suddenly make the application, and you're a bunch of wicked sinners. It's just, just a big 180 there. There's a place for telling stories from God's Word. There is, absolutely. They're in God's Word for a reason, they're part of the Word of God. Um, I, I poke fun sometimes at what I call storyteller preachers. Um, and I don't mean that they tell stories from the Bible. I mean that they tell about, they use about one verse every 40 minutes, and, and then they got about 15 stories from their own life and one story from the Bible. Those are, those are storyteller preachers. And, and people like them. A lot of evangelists are storyteller preachers because there's a lot of emotion involved. There's a lot of stomping and spitting involved. Um, but usually there's not a whole lot of Word of God involved. And, and that's, you know, sad because the Word of God is what's quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged two -edged sword. The Word of God is what is our power, the power of God on this earth to salvation. It's, it's not, not my life experiences. But there is definitely a place for telling stories from the Old Testament. We talk about David and Goliath. We talk about uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer. We, we've looked at so many different things. We're in Genesis as a study right now. And the, the problem, though, is if you look at all those stories and you don't apply them to the here and now. If you look at all and read those stories and say, that's a wonderful story, and you're done with it, that's nice, you know the Bible a little better now, but it doesn't help us if we don't say, that's a wonderful story, look at how, uh, look at how Joseph's brothers and us are similar, and we need to cut it out. You know, but look, that's a wonderful story, look how Joseph forgave and forgot and, and, and was just like Christ to his brothers, we need to do that. And we, you have to tell the story and apply it to the, the people that we're talking to. When you're witnessing and you're talking about something in the Bible, you've got to make sure that you make them understand that this isn't just some old historical fact. It applies today. It has meaning today and can be helpful to us today. Uh, there's not a single verse in the Bible that's not helpful in some way uh, today. It's, the Bible's not outdated. We don't need to rewrite it. We don't need to update it. It's, it's all... As we've seen throughout the book of Genesis, it deals with the same issues in culture and, and, and in churches that we're having today. It deals with back in Genesis. So he, uh, he makes application to the people that he's with after, after going a long time just talking about the Old Testament uh, times there. And in verse 54 and verse 57, we haven't read yet. Let's read those two verses apart from the rest. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Verse 57, then that he cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Now, obviously this is an example of the wrong response to conviction. You consider the evidence of the power of God's word. Stephen is preaching and they are cut to the heart. Hebrews 4.12, we know the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces, it cuts. That's what the Word of God does to the heart. In Acts 2.37, if you remember a little while back in our study, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked from their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's the proper response to conviction. I think it's funny to notice that the, the one group, they were cut to the heart, and the other group, they were pricked in the heart. A cut is deeper than a prick. You know, you go to the doctor's office, you gotta, you got to do the little finger, the finger prick. Nobody loves it. Nobody enjoys that, but, it, but it's better than a cut. You can, you can prick your finger or you can cut your finger. There's two different things. A cut is a little deeper. And so I think about that situation. I think about, you know, on the day of Pentecost when people were pricked in their hearts, you've got just everyday people going about their everyday business and, and they're out in the street preaching, and they get convicted, saying, what do we do? But then in, in Acts chapter 7, we have people who are the leadership of the church, people who are uh, the ones who have captured this man, Stephen, and are putting him on trial. And so God doesn't just have to poke him a little to get him convicted. He's got to cut him. And there's, there are hearts in this world that are harder than others. And it might take... You know, it might take one of those little toy hammers to, to get you back where you need to be, and it might take a sledgehammer to get to get your neighbor back where they need to be. The Lord deals with us as, as much and as heavily as we need dealt with, but not everybody responds the same way. 
there's there's been so many times you, you see people you know from from here I have a vantage point. Brother Ken knows this as well. You you can see people during the altar call. Some people are, are crying. Some people are heading to the altar. Some people are heading to the back door. Everybody responds differently to conviction, and um, and it's just you know right here we have a good example. In, in one chapter in Acts we have what do we do? In another chapter we have gnashing on them with their teeth. I've made people mad. I, I don't know that I've ever made them that mad. That, that's always been a striking verse to me in the Bible. You, you read all the time about people renting their clothes, and I think that's you know that's kind of dramatic. But um, but it was something they did. But to gnash on someone with your teeth because you don't like what he said, I mean, it sounds like we're dealing with toddlers here. But it's grown men who are in leadership roles in, in what I, I'll say the church. It's not the church, we get that, but it's, it's the religion of the day. And, and so it just goes to show you that the word of God can get through and, and do something to everyone. It's just a matter of how are they going to respond. I think there's three different ways that people respond to conviction. The first one is shown right here, anger. Anger. They get convicted in their heart, they feel bad over their sin, and they don't like that feeling, and they get mad about it, they say, I don't like that person that made me feel this way, because they don't consider that God made me feel that way, and so they say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be mean to Brother Pete to make him shut up about Christ, because every time he comes around talking about Christ, I feel bad. I don't want him to do that anymore, so I'm gonna be mean to him. And so, so there's an anger response. Uh, there's the repentance response, which is that's what we're praying and hoping for all the time. You know, whether in an altar or in a pew or, or in the back of your garage, you know, men being faced with Holy Spirit conviction do sometimes respond properly and grow closer to God. Maybe it's getting saved. Maybe it's just getting back where you need to be in church. Uh, maybe it's a relationship that needs mended and the Lord's convicting you about it, whatever it may be. Some people do repent and they get closer to the Lord. And then I think, though, the third one, we have anger and repentance. Those are the two everybody thinks of. But I think there's a third that I think is most prevalent in churches today, and that is rejection. Rejection. Uh, the, as a response to conviction among churchgoers, I think the most common one is to reject that conviction and ignore it. You, you don't get mad at the preacher necessarily, and, but you don't get right. You just get out. You just leave, and you just hope that by, by dessert at lunch, you, you won't feel convicted anymore if you just ignore it. I, I've seen, you know, in youth rallies, people that just, they're holding on to that hymn book with all they've got. They've got white fingertips because they're just clenching it because they're so focused on that. Like, if I could just get through this altar call without moving my feet, everything will be fine because then we're going to start talking about sports again. We're going to start talking about girls again. And Everything's going to be fine. But right now, it's just me and the Holy Spirit, and I can't handle it. And he doesn't want to go to the altar, but he doesn't, you know, but he's not going to get mad about it because he was raised right or whatever it may be. But he's just, just not going to respond. I'm just going to not do anything and hope this feeling passes. The sad part is the feeling probably will pass. And that conviction will pass. And the next time, it'll be a little harder for you to be convicted, a little harder for you to be convicted. And then you're one of the many, many churchgoers who... You don't, you're not mad at the pastor, you're not happy about the church, you're just kind of in the middle, you can take it or leave it, and because you don't have any conviction in your life anymore, because you just ignore it. Conviction is, is a message from God that we need to do some business with the Lord. And so I, I think the most often that I see is just rejection of the conviction, not repentance, not anger, but just rejection, just ignore it. In verses 55 through 56 and 59 through 60, we see the final acts of the man of God, Stephen. So let's read those, uh, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, this is while he's being gnashed on with the teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That's what makes him... Uh, come out, you know, and stop their ears and run on them. Verse 59, and they stoned, or I'm sorry, yeah, they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And we had said this, he fell asleep. Now, these final acts, first of all, you have him looking up. 
Bible specifies he, he looked up, saw the glory of God. And if, if we could just remember to look up when things are bad, when things are hard, if we could just look up and remember and see the glory of God, boy, that would help a lot. If we'd stop looking around and start looking up, Psalm 121, 1 and 2 say, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. We'll just remind ourselves of that, to remind ourselves that, that he's up there, and we're down here, and uh, that, that'll help us to get through those difficult situations. I don't know about you, I've never had a crowd of angry people biting me, uh, but, but there's, yeah, there's been times where it's difficult, and I forget, you know, I just gotta look up, just gotta think about my Savior, things will be better. He saw Jesus, he didn't see the stones being thrown, he didn't see Saul standing by, he didn't see the anger on the faces of his killers, he saw Christ standing at the right hand of the Father, so often I find myself being reminded that I need to just look to my Savior and not all the distractions, not all the sorrows, not all the fears, just look to the Lord. And I think it's cool that, that it specifies that, that Christ was standing at, at his Father's side. Because uh, we know from many places, you know, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, uh, but it's just one of those things where, you know, Stephen gets to see Christ standing next to God. It's almost like the Lord's just standing up saying, hey, I want a better view of that. I want to get up and see what's going on down there. And I like he's like uh, supporting Stephen. I like that. He testified. Did you catch that? He saw it, and then he said what he saw. While they're, while they're beating him and biting him and, and getting ready to kill him, he's like, hey, guys, I'm looking. I see something. I see something. He's testifying as he was losing his life. He was telling others that Christ was at the throne of God. That message alone was, was, would have been enough to have them stone him. They're already doing it. You might as well tell the message, right? <laughs> like, well, I'm dying. I might as well tell you what I see. Fourth thing, he prayed. Just as Christ on Calvary, Stephen, innocent of any wrongdoing, prayed to God while being killed. And not only prayed, but he forgave. Just as Christ in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen prayed for the forgiveness of his murderers. And then uh, the last thing. He met a peaceful end. Death by stoning is, is not peaceful. Death by stoning is a brutal, brutal act. I know I have not witnessed or taken part in that, but uh, I've, I've looked into it, I've studied it out, uh, and you can just use your imagination if you have much of one at all. Um, death by stoning, depending on who's doing the throwing and the size of the rock, it could be over in one throw, or it could be over in a hundred throws. And you, you can just imagine, anybody ever play dodgeball? No, I'm the only one? Okay, well, anybody on the wrong end of the dodgeball? Yeah, I mean, you get to where you're the last one, and everybody's like, catch it. And you're like, I'm just trying not to die. And then, you know, you got 50 balls thrown at your face at the same time, and, and it hurts, and it's embarrassing, and then you're done. But you walk away, and there's usually no blood involved. Usually. Usually. But stoning, it's, you know, it's the whole line of people, just you standing there, and they're not throwing soft, fluffy balls at you. They're throwing rocks, and you don't walk away from it, typically. Paul did a couple times. Christ, you know, Christ walked away when they were trying to stone him. But, uh, but here, Stephen just takes it. And so it's, it's not peaceful, but yet the wording of the passage shows that Stephen's at peace because it says he just fell asleep. You say, well, that means he died. What if it does? It doesn't say he died a brutal death. It says he fell asleep. It's an indication of peace, of, of security, of comfort. I can tell you after last night, we, we had kids awake all night because they something they weren't comfortable. Ellie kept trying to kick her legs around and move around, and Jude was grunting and groaning, trying to move around in his bed. He fell out of his bed at one point. It's just, sometimes you just can't get comfortable but when you fall asleep, it's a sign that you're, you're at peace, you're comfortable, you're relaxed. And so the Bible using that word is just kind of is a blessing to me uh, because I know, I've heard many, many stories of, of Christians who have gone on to be with the Lord and they'll tell me, you know, like it, it was just the most peaceful thing. You know, they just, in their sleep or even while awake, not every, not, it doesn't always go that way. But there's a lot of examples of, of people who, you know, when, you, when you know the Lord and you have a close walk with the Lord and you know you're just about to go see your Savior and 
and the pain is going to be gone, and the sorrow is going to be gone, and you're just going to be with him forevermore. There's no need for the begging and the crying out for one more hour. There's no need for the for the pleading and, you know, I don't want to die. There, there's none of that because you're ready. And it's peaceful. The story of Stephen is very short in God's word considering, I mean, considering what we know about him. It's one of those things we wish we, we knew more. Um, but that brief account, we find he's a great man of God, filled with the Holy Ghost, preaching the gospel, disputing and convincing others of the Lord, serving as a deacon, and finally standing for Christ when it meant his own death. In all things Stephen did uh, that we have record of, he is a great example for all Christians to follow. There's very few men in the Word of God that, that have more than a couple verses about their life that don't have a, but he also did this. You know, but there's a lot of kings. He was a good king, but he, he did this. He was, a, he was a decent king, but he did this. There, and there's prophets. You know, you get a couple chapters in, and then the prophet messes up. You get a couple chapters in, and the pastor, the preacher messes up. And, and there's very few people in the Bible where it's like, yeah, we, we don't have anything negative to say about him. And that is Stephen. He's one of those people. Nothing negative to say about him in the Word of God. Good example for us to follow. That is Acts chapter number 7. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word and for the examples of the people in it that stood for you, Lord, regardless of their own safety and well-being. We thank you for examples like Stephen, Lord. We thank you for the reminder that, Lord, when we are being tried for our faith, when we are under that stress and that pressure, Lord, Stephen and, and Christ yourself, Lord, several times didn't answer the question that was asked, but rather used it as an opportunity to preach the gospel and to preach the message that was needed for the people he was talking with. Lord, we pray for you to give us that ability, uh, give us the ability to look up when we're in hard times, Lord, to, to see you and to know you're there, and Lord, to be at peace. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all you do for us. Pray for you to be with the service to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.